okay, tell us uh, your name. And My name is Joe Wickham. And when and where were you born? I was born in Eames, Iowa, December 20th, 1911. What brought you to Brevard County? Well, my father, while he, when he was in college, bought 40 acres of land in Florida, sight unseen, for five dollars down and five dollars a month. And in the early uh, in the early days and in the early 20s, things were tough all over, and banks were closing and everything else. So he came down there to see where his 40 acres was. He had never seen it, and at that time. <laughs> He came down, and uh, that piece of land was west of, uh, well, west of Malabar. There's a nice big shopping center on it in the, in the, uh, at, at the present time. And he was an engineer, and uh, among the things that he was trying to find a job someplace also, and he met another engineer by the name of Jim Hunter, and they were the engineers who laid out the Melbourne Timlin Drainage District, which is practically all of this section of the South Brevard, south of Melbourne. And that's the way we came here. And uh, I graduated from New Galley High School in 1928. We came here in 1926. And uh, well, there were a lot of people here in those days. Uh, there were five in my class, and I was the only boy. So when you came here, you were a teenager. I was a teenager. And what are your impressions? What did you think when you got here? I there? thought this was one of the greatest spots in the world because I loved the outdoors and I could fish any place I wanted to and could go hunting and there was all types of ducks and deer in this country in those early days. And every little boy in the community knew how to fish. And I had a little old rowboat that had a, sail, a sailboat rig on it and I could sail all over this river. and, and it was just a great spot for a young person to live. Of course, I didn't have a lot of society to meet, but I had the outdoors, and that's exactly why I enjoyed it so much. What kind of house did you live in then? Well, first of all, we lived in, we, in a couple of rental houses. Then we went to, we moved out to the old KMI, the Kentucky Military Institute, which was an area which was south of uh, of the creek here in O'Galley. And the, uh, and in, in some big old barracks that they had there, because in the early days, the Kentucky Mili Military Institute used to come down here and uh, live during the winter time when the weather was bad up there. That was one of the places I lived, and another place which we lived was up on uh, Highland Avenue, one of the high world houses, which is up there at the present time. And uh, in those days, you know, there weren't a lot of automobiles to get in your way and everything else. And uh, I remember an old gentleman who lived next door. He would walk out to the street, look up and down the street, and if he didn't see anything, he'd go and get in his car and back out in the street, you know. And, and he just assumed there was no, no one would be coming. Very unique area in which to live. And the weather was fantastic. Did you have uh, heat in your house? We had a fireplace. Uh, in those days, we had fireplaces, and what you would do, you would build a nice little fire, and, and uh, then they would let it smolder all night or, or bank it. And, and, and those, uh, very frankly, those old fireplaces were all you needed. When, the way the house was designed, and you had big high windows in the old houses, you know, so that during the summertime, you had cross ventilation. And then they got real sophisticated, and kind of began to put the fan, attic fans up in the ceiling and, they, and you could crack your windows about a, four or five inches and turn that big fan on and it would suck the, all the air through it and it was like an air conditioning unit and uh, it was quite a spot but I'll tell you one thing I learned in, in the, when I, during the war when I was in the South Pacific I promised myself if I ever got back on that Indian River no one would ever get me off from it and I've been in the river since. Oh, let's talk a little bit about more what you what you did when you were a kid. You must have gone to school. You say you were the only boy? I graduated from the Old Galley High School in 1928, and it just happened in my class I was the only boy. We had a lot of little local fellows that were outstanding athletes. We used we had a cross-country team, as an example, that won the state championship, and, uh, and I think that was because they had to run around in this rough land and didn't have to worry about it. And then when they found a the flat piece, they thoroughly enjoyed it. But 
it was interesting, uh, an interesting community. We had, during the winter time, you know, we had a lot of well-to-do people come here from up north, and uh, it was just a great spot in which to do it. And there were not so many things to divert young people's attention that they couldn't apply themselves to the community. And uh, how were your teachers? Do you remember your teachers? We had outstanding teachers out here. And they, they were very talented. They all came usually from someplace else. And I remember <coughs> One la lady that taught literature, who was a niece of Sidney Lanier, you know, the great poet. And uh, that kind of people came to us. And we had fellows that were mathematicians that, uh, that were just out of this world, you know. And, and I, uh, we were lucky, very frankly, because th these, these people come, all come from someplace else, but they wanted to come down to Florida, and that's the way they got here. And, they, and we young people and enjoy the benefits of going to school under that condition. Yeah, you, that is lucky because yeah. oftentimes a small community won't have that kind you of... You see, in the beginning, uh, they, uh, we didn't have a county school board uh, like they have today. We had trustees for each little community. I was on the trust one of the trustees at one time for, for the O'Galley area. And, uh, and all of, uh, during, the, during this time, you know, <coughs> we had... Uh, $5,000 homestead exemption because of the uh, rough times in the beginning, you know, in, in the in the 20s when the, cra the crash came and everything else, and to keep you from losing your fa your home, they give you a $5,000 homestead exemption. What they would do, they would assess your property at $4,999.50 if you didn't have anything else, so you didn't have to pay taxes. And the only people who paid taxes was the young businessman or the person who had rental property. And, uh, and so we had to change that, and I was responsible for getting them to assess their property up to 65% of its true value, you know. But when was that? When, when did in you the change 20s, that? In the 20s. Well, when I first got on the commission was in 1952. That's when we began to do that. Um, let's see. So you were here as a teenager, and then... Times were kind of tough. These were the Depression times. That is correct. There wasn't a lot of money going around. Well, there wasn't hardly any money going around, and, and I have my father survey and a lot of things, and then I knocked all around the country looking for work. I used to leave here in the, every summer and go out and work in the wheat fields, you know, and I'd go all the way up into Canada. And uh, that was the only jobs that were available. But I'll tell you one thing it did, it got you in good physical shape, you know. But you would hitchhike, or you didn't have an automobile in there because you couldn't afford it, most of them. But it was an interesting spot to live, and uh, more nice people came to us than any other spot in, in the country because of, of, of the climate down. Mm -hmm. When you got to be uh, just about uh, draft age is when the war, World War II, was... Yes, I was, uh, I was in the construction business, and I was... I was a superintendent, one of the superintendents that built the Melbourne fighter base, which is now known as the Melbourne Airport. And uh, I volunteered in the, in the Navy. And they left me there until uh, I finished the hospital one night they, I was at the, at the uh, base. And I thought, well, they forgot where I am. And the next morning I had my orders to proceed to Norfolk, you know, because I was a, a warrant officer in the... Uh, that's the way I got into the Navy, and then I spent three years in the South Pacific. What were you doing out there? Building uh, airstrips and uh, landing facilities. Built many, many airstrips all through, all the way through the Solomons and New Guinea and, and Philippine Islands. Here. Were you a part of the Seabees? Yes, the Seabees Battalion. Yeah. Quite an interesting time out there. Three, I spent three years out there. And you, you learned a lot about construction and changing and, and, land. And, and, and mosquito control. It was pretty bad out there, too. Oh, it was terrible out there. And the, uh, but yeah, in, the, in the unit that we were in, the CB, we were good at what we were doing because all of us had had experience in uh, all types of construction and road building and bridge building and all that sort of thing. And uh, Having lived here in Florida in the days before mosquito control and everything else, I had a pretty good insight on what was going on even down there. It was a great place, and uh, but I was glad to get home after peace was declared. So you came straight back. I came back, and uh, yeah, the uh, 
and in those days there was no airport, no air facilities here in the, in the, in the city of Melbourne or O'Galley. And we landed in a little old DC-3 in Vero Beach, and that's the way I got home. But I'd have walked home if they'd give me half a chance. <laughs> Did you find it changed when you came back? It, it was still very quiet in the community. But we had, uh, because of the uh, Banana River uh, Airport and uh, uh, Banana River Base and that sort of thing, time had changed. A lot of people had been here and gone, you know. And uh, and with the uh, fighter base down at uh, at Melbourne, uh, we had uh, we had a whole new uh, group of people who come to us. Those who worked here and who wanted to stay here and came back after the war. It was kind of a unique spot in which to live. We had a, a big, uh, that was the beginning of our growth. The real growth in our community came when we established permanent mosquito control because before that everybody wanted to get away from here by about May because the mosquitoes were so bad. How bad were they? Oh, yeah, they, some of the people used to say, they'd get a hold of them and say, no, well, the mosquitoes are, they're going to eat you here, they're going to drag you down a little closer to the river, you know. But when we started permanent mosquito control and dredging and filling in the area, we found out that for the first time we could walk down the streets in, the, in Melbourne and O'Galley, as an example, in the daytime without carrying a swisher and beating off the mosquitoes. So that is the way we began the permanent mosquito control. Then we bought more dredges, more drag lines, and people like Sal Mella uh, were in charge of the organization. And uh, one of the first things we hired was Lee Winter, who became a county commissioner. And uh, we realized we were headed in the right direction, and we did a great job on the mosquito control for many, many years. And that's the way we got it started. When you say we, you mean the county? I mean the county. Uh, I mean, the, through the county commission, we were the ones that approved the, the, the money and set up the whole program. And we hired, once in a while, we did the smart thing. We hired some people who knew how to fly and knew how to make things work. and. Uh, and the leadership in that program in those days is what made it such a success, very frankly. When did you come on the county commission? I came on in 1952. I had been on the city of O'Galley's uh, city council for quite some time, and they finally talked me into that. I, I stayed on th three terms, and then I quit uh, for two terms, and then they kept after me, and I went on back again and stayed on three more terms. So. Uh, I was basically here. When I first went on the county commission, there was only about 20,000 people in the whole county, and about 600 people paid all the taxes. So we've come a long ways from those days. But it did, uh, it, it, we did the right thing. We opened the community, got rid of the mosquitoes and everything, and made it a lovely space to live. And probably no, no spot in the United States has had more nice people come to it than Brevard County because of the highly intelligent people, you know, college and come because of the missile program and because of all of these other things. This is the way, for instance, FIT was formed because they, they were fellows who were working in the missile program and at the Cape and decided that they wanted to be part of our community and started the college. And, uh, uh, and this is one of the most unique spots in the, in the world. You go to Sunday school, you find out every little school teacher was a college graduate and that sort of thing. Normally you don't see that. And it, it was very, uh, people, the, the class of people who come to our community are like what made our community what it is today. And, and we've got a lot to be thankful for. When you were on the commission, as well as dealing with uh, mosquito control, you had to deal with roads. Road Tell us a little bit about that. Well, there, were a lot, there weren't many roads. I remember that as an example that we just started working over on the beach and, and, and I had help with a, a survey A1A many, many years ago. And we were starting to put what is known on as South Patrick Drive, you know, and all. And uh, and I remember we were just trying to figure out what he was going to call it. And Dave Nesbitt, who was an old commissioner friend of mine, and those are, he said, let's call that A Wickham A C. And, but I laid out all these roads, they said, oh, Joe Wickham's lost his mind. He's building roads so far out in the country, no one will ever find them. That's Wickham and South Patrick Drive and Babcock and 
I got them back in the early days when you got all the right of ways for nothing, you know, and everything like that. And uh, it's paid dividends many, many times. And uh, we acquired our parks and all that sort of stuff back in those same days. And uh, we just, uh, uh, we took advantage of people because they all thought that the, it wasn't going to be worth anything at all, you know. But what, when I put in one or two roads and they began to see the value of the property, I didn't have any problem at that time on getting right away, you know, when somebody else had had to prove them that they could do it. I guess for the property owners who had property way back here, having a, a good road was a good thing. Yeah, well, in those days, you know, land was worth about $28 an acre, you know, if you could find a customer. And uh, just look at it today, they, uh, with some of the prices they pay are astronomical. But that's all because we did, we made big wide right of for the roads. We drained the land, and most people don't understand that in the beginning, most of this land was underwater in some state. And we put in the, the necessary drainage. People today think it's always been like this. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful country because we did what was necessary to solve the problem in those days. Did uh, your dad ever talk to you about when they were laying out the Tillman drainage district, oh, what yeah, they ran I, into? Oh, yes, and they laid out all of that, and it, it was underwater. It was all basically underwater in those days. And they, and of course, he had a he had a terrific engineering background, you know, and uh, and and his intention, along with with Jim Hunter, was the fact that they wanted to dry the land out so the people had something to talk about and to, and to utilize their land. But all that land that you see out there, where there's thousands of houses now and everything else, was basically under under water, and they, and so they did a great job and they laid that. The engineering and laying out of that whole tel timber drainage district fit the back and south end of the county, and then uh, just north of that came the uh, Crane Creek drainage district, which is the area which is from the uh, uh, U.S. 192 north up into uh, O'Galley, and that those old timers weren't, weren't so dumb at that. You know, they they laid out these whole drainage districts, and uh, and and made the land available and accessible as you see it today. How would they get back into that swampy area to survey it? They waded it in, and then when I was a young fellow, that's why I used to drag a chain in that mud and that water, and I thought nothing of being sometimes way deep in the water out there. But that's what, and in the early days, in the real early days, they, in the, uh, the federal government had stayed out, uh, laid out a lot of section lines, you know, and everything else. Some places, for, for instance, over on the beach, and, and, the, the mosquitoes were so bad and everything else, they'd set out in the river there in the uh, Indian River, in the Banana River, and draw the shoreline, and they called that the meander line over there, you know. And, uh, and you found some interesting things that uh, when you begin to really survey it, you know. And, and there was a lot of litigation in the early, early days, each, uh, trying to clear up right away and everything else. The Gleasons and uh, Carlos Canova and the uh, Aspen Walls and all of those people were really having a terrible time get, keeping things straight because none of, none of the engineering had worked, you know, because they they, they weren't going to get eat up with all those, those mosquitoes and those rattlesnakes and everything else that were over there. It was quite interesting. So the, the very first survey was kind of sketched in. They didn't get out there and really do it. Yeah, I remember way back in the, in the early days that uh, I got on a survey crew that were in the north county line from the ocean to Maytown, which is a little little town way back over near Sanford, you know, through the swamps, and there was beer, there was deer and bear and everything else, you know, in, in, in that uh, back country in those days. It was quite an experience, and the, uh, no one had even touched it from the early days when they had surveyed, the federal government had surveyed the section. But I... Uh, I, I attribute that to a lot of the nice things that I know about our community because I'm involved with it all, all the way through its growth and 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 what it is today. And there's been a lot of good leadership in our community, and and that's helped. A lot of things happen real quickly, which is, that is unusual. True. And the uh, we who who lived there realized that you know they, we went through the cycle of the boom days of the twenties. Then when the Depression came, there was nothing, there was no food, nothing to eat, 
and most people talk they they don't understand that they uh, used to have to eat swamp cabbage and they eat uh, and they lived on mullet and everything else and even the, the environmentalists today don't understand that there was a time the only meat we had was when we butchered sea turtles you know and uh, and, and that was part of the uh, survival of those days and of course today they're trying to protect which is right so that but I remember when I was on the, many a time when I was on the beach, that I'd see a dark object over there, and when I was trying to gather some eight, uh, turtle eggs and so forth, and I'd come up and I'd see a, a bear would be digging, uh, digging uh, the, the turtle eggs down there to eat. You know, but people don't realize that that's the way it used to be in the early days, and you wouldn't think there would be a lot of deer and bear in this country, but there were. They migrated north, and there's still much of uh, a lot of of that type of thing up around the Cape area, which they've preserved and done such a beautiful job with. Quite interesting. No, oh, I'll say, I'll say. I can, um, I, Judge Platt told us that during the 20s got to be, you couldn't find a cabbage palm anywhere. That's true. And they, uh, and they got to be experts in, they called it, some of the aristocrats called it harder, plain, harder palm, but the old cracker folks called it swamp cabbage. The same thing though. But it was, uh, if you were hungry, it was good. Yeah. And, uh, and and he, he's right. The Platts were great people in the, in the developing of our back country, you know. And, and you had to give them credit. They, they weathered many a storm out there, you know. And, and, uh, but they they were they were pioneer type people. They and the Gleasons and all these other people, you know. And they, uh, now, now we're finding that uh, Everybody thinks that all that land belongs to the state, even though they've been paying taxes on it for 150 years, and whether you like it or not. When, when the federal government sold it to them in the state, they own it, and, they, and if they're going to try to take it from them, they ought to compensate them for it. It's just that simple. And, uh, but it's, uh, Florida is here to stay, and we're going to have more and more people all the time, and it's because of the type of people who were the pioneers, and the people who weren't, who followed along behind them, like me, who had a mania for making, putting in roads and draining the land, and then, the, and it, it, it's paid dividends many, many times. Let's see, um, just to go back to our list here, you talked a little bit about what the roads were like when you were a kid. What were they made out of? They were made out of marl, and, uh, and uh, the fruits they dug out of the ground. And some of them, for instance, are down along the area from Cocaine Ridge south, which goes down to a galley in that section. They'd get there was a lot of rock on the shoreline, and they'd get down in that and dig it up and grind it up and, and spread that. And uh, over on the beach, uh, just north of the old galley causeway, and south of where uh, the yacht club is over there now, there was a tremendous big Indian mound over there. And uh, over a period of many, many years, they hauled it away and put it on the roads with shell, you know. And uh, that's that. But that mound was a tremendous mound, and uh, and it just it looked. And then that they had come there because the Indians, for hundreds and hundreds of years, had stopped there and eat eat the eat the shell. The, I mean the oysters and the mussels and all that kind of stuff. And they just shelled them right there, and then they would bury. Sometimes it would be some of their, uh, if one died, some of the family, they'd bury him down in this, uh, all this shell. And there was a big mound there. It must have been 15, 20 feet high. I know Honeymoon Hill in Merritt Island is. Honeymoon Lake up there, yeah, is, is, a, is a perfect example. And that was a ridge area there, and that beautiful little lake down in there. All the young people, when I was a young fella, lived in that area when they wanted to go someplace. There. When they got married or something, couldn't go any place else. They go down to hunt. I see. They call it Honeymoon Lake. You know, you know where I'm talking about the lake down there. They uh, go down to camp. You know, and, and, and on, on a wedding trip. I wonder how many people today would want to go down there and camp on a wedding trip because they couldn't go any place else. But still, just as pretty. Beautiful, as it's beautiful little lake. Yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah. kind of hidden. If you're in the river, you don't know it's you there. You don't know it's there, but it's a little narrow street uh, area there on the west side of it. You know, on the and uh, but it was an isolated spot even from the early days because uh, most people don't realize but that section over there it, it has been a beautiful <laughs> section and uh, Georgia and that section all these years there are people living there 
I remember one time way many, many years ago, and the church is still standing there in Georgiana. I was building some houses up on the north of there and over on Cocoa Beach. And I kept watching, and that poor little church was expanding on, you know, they, they were falling apart. And I couldn't hardly stand it, so I ended up getting some angle iron and some big bolts and everything. And, and I didn't ask anybody or anything else, but when we were coming home, I'd stop a few minutes early and put all this up. And finally, we jacked the, that church all together and put those tie rods in there and, uh, and made it like it. It's still sitting there, and if you go there, and it's a beautiful little church. Fixed it all, and I've often said that was uh, we got paid by the Lord for doing that. And, uh, and it's been a beautiful little church, but they didn't have any money, you know, or anything else. And I, every time I go by there now, I, I think of that. And uh, we, we did it after work coming back. Isn't that interesting? Oh, that's marvelous. And, uh, they must have thought uh, some kind of angels were coming by. Well, the old people over there just didn't have any money. And we didn't even ask anybody. The door was always open, you know, and, uh, and uh, you, could you imagine having a place like that today? With the doors open and everything else, they'd, they'd have it demolished. Oh. Well, I can't imagine doing any building without a permit today. Well, <laughs> they didn't know what permits were in those days, you know. And in other words, uh, they built many, many things. And, and they, uh, it's when we begin to get all the, the influx of people and everything else. Because they didn't have any building codes or anything else when I first went on the commission in 1952. And we established building codes, plumbing codes, and subdivision and flat laws. We did all of that because of the impact that was already beginning to be a part of our growth. And had we not an ODP and I, uh, who lived incidentally up in the central part of the county now, we got together and did all of this. And it paid dividends many, many times because we... Uh, we got a community which is worth living in for present time. No doubt about that. Um, there were there were other kinds of transportation uh, that was used a lot when you were younger. Not so much now. That the railroad was important. Well, everybody the, the old railroad, yes, and the, it uh, in the early days it, they just followed the high ground, you know, and uh, over a period of many, many years they. The way it runs through Cocoa and has been changed out to where it is today. You know, Galley, it used to come down uh, Guava, which is one block uh, west of Highland Avenue, and then it went down to the uh, down to the uh, Indian River. In the beginning, that was the end of the railroad while they built the bridges across the, the O'Galley River and Crane Creek. And then they came out and came on down, and you know where the post office is in Ogala? They came, they went, ran right to the post office area and went over across there and just missed where David's construction company, my old construction company, is at the present time, and was there for many years. Then they decided that they wanted to move it, and I think this is a very historical thing, wanted to move it and straighten it out where you see it today. And Grandpa Gleason, that uh, Lansing Gleasons and Bill Gleasons, uh, Lansing's father and, and Bill's grandfather, this, he uh, owned all the land out there, and he told them that he would give them the right of way through there if they would stop all the passenger trains there, because if he wanted to go to St. Augustine or Palm Beach, he didn't want to have to go down to Melbourne or to, uh, to uh, Bureau Beach to catch the train. So they made that agreement, and for many, many years, Every passenger train, big Pullman train that came from New York or came up from mine was stopped out there. And so Grandpa Gleason, if he wanted to get on, could go up there and go either, go either direction. I thought that was a very unique thing. But he was a fine old, uh, uh, old gentleman, and uh, that's where the East Coast Railroad is where it is today in our community. That's a great story. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I bet some of the conductors didn't even know why they were stopping in O'Galley. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the Gleason family and how they came to this county. Well, the Gleason family, I understand, uh, first came here right after the Civil War, uh, uh, looking over areas in which to put the, all of those who uh, throughout the South who uh, who had been 
part of the Civil War problem of uh, with all of the laboring class and the working class, you know, and, and to give them a place to stay. And they uh, apparently came into this area that one of the Gleasons and uh, and he thought that there were too many problems to have a lot of sla slaves in this area, and there and there were because of the mosquitoes and everything else. But they, they owned, the, they got into this land and involved in those early days. And, and if you read history, they uh, <coughs> got quite involved in the state state problems, legislative and all. And they tried to start a college here in our community and that sort of thing. But. They invested in a lot of land, and they threw out the entire area, not only on the beaches, but in the backlands and up and down the river. And uh, and throughout all of this, they they were great pioneers for our community because they brought a, a new culture to the to our community that's, that's still here. And uh, they've been a very important part of the progress and development of, of our community. All those meander lines I was telling you about that were in the wrong place over on the on the beach area. It was through their efforts in Washington that they were able to get this all straightened out, you know, so that the, the surveys fit the the, the land as, as it is, and the and all of that sort of thing. And they've been great people in our community. When I was pushing for roads and everything of that type, they made I didn't ever have to ask for. Uh, how much they wanted for the right of way. They always wanted to give the right of way because they knew that <clears throat> whatever I was doing would help their 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 land. And many of the roads that you see today were uh, given by them. They were involved in the Melbourne Airport. In the beginning, they owned m much of the property where the Melbourne Airport is today. And they, they have been leaders, and they laid out the original plat of the old village of O'Galley, you know. All this sort of thing, and uh, and they've been on the progressive side of our community because they've helped make the community work as you see it today. And instead of taking a negative position at all times, trying to figure out how much they could make off from it, and because they've taken care of their land and made sure that people that they got proper uh, uh, access to it and everything else, they. Uh, they didn't care where I put a road just as long as I told them where it was going to be and wrote the legal description, and that's good. And they thought, and uh, way back in the early days, they, when I was laying out all these roads, they thought, oh, Joe Wickham has lost his mind. He's building roads so far out in the country, no one will ever find them. And uh, they think I'm a lot smarter now than when I was doing it, you know. But it's quite an interesting thing. But all the, I had no problem dealing with with the with the Gleasons or the Platts, all of these old timers, they when they begin to realize that I was doing for the community what needed to be done, and it's been a great thing. And uh, and there's still a lot of the Gleason family around. And Bill Gleason, I know you know Bill. He's a well, he's a very fine, well-known lawyer in our community, and they still have a lot of uh, land within our community and are an important part of the future development of our area. When you were thinking about laying out roads, how did you approach the problem? Well, the first thing I did was I had been, when I worked out in the wheat fields and everything else, you know, out through the Middle West, I noticed that all the roads that they somehow ended up on section or half section lines, you know. So I pushed when I first got on the County Commission to put reserved right of ways on each side of the, of the section line. In other words, so that if you come in to develop your piece of land, you had to leave that that much access for a road along the section lines and all. And it's paid dividends many, many times because the, the people realize that when they come in and, and they want to do it in, in, in my district, as an example, they knew that if they wanted to have a subdivision developed in, in the area, that I wanted to right away across the, every section line. And we reserved and they, and and the Gleasons had signed this agreement in the beginning, which gave us many accesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, people today don't realize that that's the way you had to do things in those days. They just paid dividends many, many times for our community. What about the causeways? Well, the, the causeways, uh, well, the, the local people pushed for the causeways. And the one in Melbourne was one of the first ones. And then Sweet Smith uh, Sr. pushed for the one in Cocoa. 
and it's been there many, many times, many, many years. And uh, I mean, in the early days, you didn't go straight on across. You went across the river and you wandered up a little north and went back down through Angel City and went across, come out in the middle of Cocoa Beach. And they pushed for the road to go straight through as you see it today and to bring 520 in from the west, you know, and, and tie it all together. And down here, they, we pushed to have us. The Melbourne was in many, many years. They built the original uh, bridge, and then if I remember correctly, it burned down a couple, three years later, and then they had to rebuild it. And uh, and uh, and then uh, the, the, uh, the last bridge in this area was the one in O'Galley here. And, uh, and we finally got it in. That was the reason that area did not develop until the last thing. Mm -hmm. Was there much boat traffic on the river? Yeah, there was, everybody had a boat when I was a young fella. And, uh, and uh, there was, uh, people don't understand this, but we had freight, little freighters that delivered all types of fr uh, freight up and down there. And they docked in Melbourne and they had regular to, uh, places to stop, just and all, all the same way. It was quite a unique thing. We had big tank, uh, boat tankers coming up and down through here. and uh, and. Uh, Back in those early days, before there was any cars around, if you wanted to go someplace and you had to, you wanted to have a picnic or something else, you got a boat and sail around. And, and there weren't a lot of outboard motors in those days, you know. But everybody had a boating complex within our community, and uh, it, this is this is the concept we had. It, the last area to develop it was the, across the O'Galley Causeway because the. Oh, Mr. Canova had his home set it over there, and he built a pier and all that sort of thing, and he brought all the lumber down the river and dragged it across to, over to, to what is now known as Canova Beach, and, and he built a big fish, uh, a fishing pier over there and all that sort of thing, and uh, he, he was an old engineer also. And uh, this is the way, and that's when we pushed to put a road across there and over to the beach. And the, uh, but Mr. Canova did, was a, and, and that's the reason they called it Canova Beach, <coughs> excuse me. And also, his daughter, uh, Pat, she died this last year, and uh, her name was Kosinski, and she gave her land for a park, uh, several hundred feet all right on the ocean over there, in honor of her family and her mother. And I think that's great. You know, most of these people that live on that beach now, I, I'm not going to tell you who they are, but a lot of them want millions of dollars for any little piece they get. But they, she dedicated this whole several hundred feet of ocean front to her family as a park. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. did that all this year. Yeah. And the, uh, so the, the, old <coughs> the old time people who were lived within our community were very important for, because they, 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 they loved the community and its history and wanted to preserve it in that manner, not to see how much money they could make off of it. Well, I imagine she remembered when she was younger, going to the beach, and, and right. that was the place to go. Did you ever go to the beach for, for a half? I rode across that river many times before the bridge got it and walked over there. And right where Canova, south of Canova, there was a little 15-foot right away that somebody had dedicated in the early days. And we could go across over there to the beach. That's the way we walked over there before they had any roads, you know. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, and then the, Mr. Mathers, John Mathers, uh, got a permit way back in about 1928 or nine to, to build the Mathers Bridge. And at the same time, they give their right away for the. the uh, right away all the way across the south end of the county out across the west to uh, to build a road and bridge and there's been a lot of controversy about that whole section in the last few years but the uh, those early days were quite interesting you know and mr Mather, i think that they charge 10 cents for a mule and and, uh, and that sort of thing and if you rode a bicycle it cost you a nickel or something it was very unique it was a toll bridge. <coughs> yeah, that's right. It was a toll bridge. Ten cents for a, a, vic, a vehicle in those days and all. The old Galley Bridge, was, they were all toll bridges in the beginning. Oh, that's amazing. I had never... Yeah. Been. It's, it was quite unique, you know. And, and uh, when, you, when you look back, that, that was the way they paid for them, you know. Mm -hmm. But 
Mather's Bridge, it was his own bridge, or was it yeah, a county he, bridge? You know, in the beginning, it was his own bridge. He paid for it and, and, and charged that much to get across it because he owned all the land, <coughs> the Mathers, between the Mathers and the Carters, and uh, Lindsay and some of them. They owned all that land on the south end of Merritt Island, and he owned most of that land right through there, so he wanted to put get get to it, and he paid for the bridge. It, it, you know, uh, private, and, and and it became later became a, a state-owned bridge, mm -hmm. town, county-owned bridge. Isn't that interesting? That's amazing. The, uh, they, these old timers. Uh, there used to be a place called Carter's Cut, which is about a mile north of that, which has all been filled in now, where they had cut. Uh, uh, Mr. Carter had cut uh, with some other people, cut a hole through the south in the Merritt Island, so they put their rowboats through there. You know. And no kidding, this is the way it was. And, and you, if you come across from the over here in the, on the mainland, you saved yourself about a half a three, or half a mile or a mile of, of with a rowboat in those early days. You know, and they called that Carter's Cut. In the, uh, so things have changed tremendously in, the, in, the, in the, these many, many years. You know. Speaking of changing the landform, one of the biggest things that happened was uh, the port there in Canaveral. Yeah, the port was, and they, and they did a great job up there. They, uh, they, they were able to get to uh, the uh, one of the house representatives, little Joe Hendricks, and, and a couple of others, and got them to support that harbor up there. And they've done a great job for the community. They were at the same time they were because I I did the core boring for it. It was to put one across it at. Uh, from Canova Beach across, you know, and because up there, they up at uh, Canaveral, they had to put big jetties out there, you know, and all, and they, right here at the uh, uh, one near Canova Beach, you could go out four or five hundred feet and you had deep water, you know, and, uh, but they didn't have the political pull and everything else to get it in there, and that, that uh, the port up there has done a great job for, that, for Brevard County in that community. You were never on the Port Authority, were you? No, thank goodness. Uh, I've been on everything else. In the, uh, but there's some uh, fellows in there uh, over a period of many years have done a great job for that Port Authority. And they were able to uh, get the canal dug from there all the way back into the Indian River, you know, across the next to the highway, so that they could move, they could bring a lot of things into the port and from the port in, into uh, in the inland water system, you know. Very, very, very clever concept. I guess they used some of that for the missiles that were coming, the big pieces. In the early, that's right. They, they, in the early days, a lot of that stuff was barged in there. And what's going to happen again, just as sure as we're sitting here, <coughs> is that when they start making these space platforms, they're not going to, they're, they're going to be bringing big pieces in by barge and by boat. And then the rest of it's going to be built right here in our own community. And people who don't don't realize that that's going to happen because all that area that, that is now theoretically vacant along the Indian River and over on Merritt Island is going to be a great big construction uh, area for the development of all of these parts that they're going to have because we got all of the, the smart know-how in our community with the class of people we got and they're going to realize it's a lot easier to build this stuff right here and. and and assemble it right here than it is to cart it all over the United States. They may not like it in other places, but that's coming. Just this year as I'm sitting here. And we're going to build the roads, to, and we're going to make the waterways adequate to take care of this thing. We're going to build railroad, and, and, and they're not going to need the railroad. They, they talk about going to Orlando. They're going to need the railroad to supply our own people and the growth we have in the, within our community. The cycle out of the Cape is, has also been kind of a boom and bust. That is true. But I'm just saying, what's happened out there, for instance, way back in the, they moved all of the, uh, under the Johnson regime, they moved all the administration to Houston. Now, now they're talking about bringing it back to where it belongs. Instead of having uh, two or three units established, no, they're going to move all the important factors close to the system which is being developed at the, at the Cape. And the outlying areas are going to be the support uh, 
people instead of the, these uh, outlying areas being the dominating factor and, and we being where the missile program is being the support people. That's coming. People are getting a little more intelligent, a little less selfish, and people begin to realize that they're, that some of these organizations in the past have uh, dictated the policy the way they wanted it, but that's changing. And uh, uh, anybody knows that if you're going to build a big missile program and all, the smartest thing to do is to get as close to it as you can to, to make it work. I think it's a question of finding political support for the program. They kind that's of spread right. it all over the country. And that, and and that's exactly votes. right. But I'm saying now they've got a, been thinking about it a long time. Now they realize that the smart thing to do is to be where the program is. Yeah. And we've got better weather theoretically the year round than anybody else. We've got everything that they need for the system. And they're all going to be a part of it. They may not be. I may not live to see it all, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be around another 20 years, maybe. And uh, our community is going to grow and fit uh, this whole system. Do you remember when the, the Cape first came in, when they first started launching rockets over on the island? Oh, yeah. I went up to some of those original shots. And, uh, and if you don't think we've come a long ways, you ought to see them today and see what they... You want to ask somebody to show you some of those old films that they... What was it like if you, if you decided you wanted to go out and You had to get permission to get up to, to see them, but when, when they went on, those original ones blew up, it was an experience. You saw them blow up? Oh, yeah, they, in the early days, they, they, it, it, they had all the trials and tribulations of a new system, and, and they've, got, they've perfected them, you know, and, and since then, and it's quite an experience. That's the reason I say that whether they like it or not, the future development of the missile program is here at Cape Kennedy and in, in the surrounding area. And it's going to benefit everybody up and down this whole East Coast and back into the interior of the state. But you can't let somebody hoard it someplace else because they, they can be a, a part of this great program. But we don't want the focal point of development of this future system to be off in the middle of the state or down in the end of the state because that isn't the way it is. Yeah. Because they, they want to be here where the action is and where they can solve their problems and do it all. You, you don't take an automobile and put wheels in one place and the, and the engine someplace else and frame someplace else and, and, and make it work. That's do you remember when they, they started foreclosing on Formila for the Merritt Island launch area? Some of the old timers weren't too happy about that. Well, they did a great job though, because they kind of got involved with it in that, in that condemnation in the beginning. And uh, but we did one of the things we did, did this, and uh, we went to those people, and they were they were taking in all those orange groves and everything, and grapefruit groves, and they were the finest groves in the country. But when they agreed to sell them to them, they also signed an agreement. I understand to let them contract with them to, to for the fruit for many, many years, and that left the, per, the people in business, and that's what they wanted to be, and uh, and it's worked out very, very satisfactorily to our community, and uh, because those people had developed some of the finest systems in, in fruit in the in the world, and, and, and they had a right to be upset, but the federal government and, and the people up there made a deal with them that they could all live with, and it's been a great thing, but not only for our own people, but for the government too, because they became a part of our community. And our Civilian Military Council, which has been so active in our community, has, has eliminated about 90 percent of any friction that could have been created by these systems, because everybody is, a, they, they all get together and talk about their problems, and they meet each other on a personal basis and is paying dividends. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about when you were young here and what it was like. Where did your family do most of their shopping? In those days, there was, uh, you didn't see a shopping center like you got today. Or, uh, for instance, in, right in Nogali, we had Carrick's Grocery, and the Carrick family said it was a very important part of the growth of our community. Down in Melbourne, they, they, they got so modern, they brought an A&P store in, you know, and then a Pig Lou Wiggly, and we finally got one up in our own community. But Basically, we traded on, on the local level, and then there were uh, with our dry goods stores and, and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, this era of uh, big stores came after the war. 
and really because of, of before that, in the early days, for instance, people like Kerry, if you had a, a yacht and came down the river, he would go down and uh, take your whole order and, you know, and deliver it to you. And then if you lived in the community and, and, uh, and wanted uh, uh, a lot of things, you could call in your order and they'd deliver it to your house. Can you, you, can you imagine such a thing today? But uh, we, we went through that cycle of uh, not only that, but doctors I can remember when Dr. Creel and Dr. Green and Dr. Hay and Dr. Hicks, and, uh, and they were, were the only doctors within our area. And there were some more in the central part of the county, you know, and uh, that's the way they've started. They were the leaders who pushed to build their first hospitals in the area. And had they not been in our community, we wouldn't have had the, those hospitals. They were great guys. And uh, and I, when I think of when, when Dr. Creel d delivered children and, and, and the people didn't have any money and uh, they'd leave a box of groceries on the front, you know, vegetables on the front porch or something else because they couldn't pay him anything else. Somehow he survived and everything else, but I, I would hate to think about one of these doctors today only getting a, 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 a bushel basket full of uh, vegetables or fruit. But, uh, Did they make house calls? Oh, yes. Everybody made house calls, the doctors in those days. Hmm. And uh, as I said, they, they, those doctors did a fantastic job within our community. and and. Uh, Things were tough in those days, you know. They, uh, you had all kinds of water problems, and I've seen them stung with stingerees and everything else, you know. But those old timers knew just exactly what to do. And Doc, Dr. Hay, when they first started this little hospital in Melbourne, his wife would do the cooking in the kitchen and everything else, and was a, was a semi nurse and everything else, and they did. They, they were part of the growth of our community and, and are the reason we've got such a good system as we have today. Did you ever, do you remember going to see the doctor when you were little? Lord, I had broken bones and uh, lots of things. And one of my brothers got burnt very severely. And they, and they first, uh, I never saw it before. And then in those days when they were trying to graft skin, they just did a, did a field job right there on the job. And of course, I got burnt real bad in World War II in an airplane crash, but it, uh, it, things were a lot different then. And they, uh, I was burnt pretty solid from the waist up. And, they, uh, and it still shows if I get out of the sun for a long time, I see it. But uh, I'm a lucky old person, and I'm very grateful for it. What about a dentist? Was there a dentist in town? Oh, yes. Uh, we had two, a couple of ducks of strange, and... Uh, and uh, one or two others, Dr. Mullins, he came down from Chicago, Dr. Mullins, because his fishing was good down here, and he retired here, and he's, some of his family still lives here. But they were great guys, and, uh, and this is the kind of, uh, these people came here basically after the war. And uh, but they, they, were, they were entirely different than those days than they are today. And they, uh, but, they were beautiful doctors, and Dennis Reed, after that came many of the Dr. Simmons and Simmons and all the other group, and and they came here because of associations of, during the war years, you know, and made it, and became a part of our community. Yeah, they, the the dental and, and, and the dental the doctors and the uh, regular doctors and surgeons all basically came here after the war, except people like Dr. Creel and. Uh, and uh, Doc I. Keeks and Dr. Bean. And, uh, but many of these you see today all are, are part of the products of, of development after the war. What about some um, courthouse stuff? Do you remember dealing with the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the sheriffs? Oh, yes. I, uh, I had a lot of interesting days with, with the sheriffs. And I was, I was a very good friend of practically everybody that was in that sheriff department. And they have basically done a great job within our community. And Bill Williams married uh, uh, Minnie Reagan. He, he was an old-time sheriff, and uh, he uh, he married a local girl, Minnie Reagan. And uh, uh, and I knew all the sheriffs after that. But and, and Bill, when he wanted to, 
if, if he wanted a prisoner, you know, he didn't do like they do today, run all over. He'd go down and send word, and he'd go down and sit in front of the fire station in O'Galley, you know, on a, on a big old block we had out there. And he'd sit there and wait for the, this guy to come because the person knew that if he didn't come and he had to go get him, he, he'd, he'd wish he had. But he would, he would do this all the time, and he was a great guy, great community-oriented person, you know, and uh, they, 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 the sheriffs in those days, they were closer to the people, you know, they'd come to the community and visit to make sure that they understood everything that was going on. Jimmy Dunn it was involved this way, and he would make tours throughout the county and stop and visit, and he, and he wanted you to, if he wanted to buy vehicles, he wanted to spread out the uh, purchase of the vehicles throughout the county and everything else. It, uh, uh, in those days, they used to be an integral part of our community. Now they, they, it's so big and cumbersome that, that even though they want to, like for instance, Jake, a great guy, but and it would, he would like to go a lot of places, but they keep him so busy with all this red tape that he can't do it. But I'll let you in on a secret. If I was in, in any position within the county or administration, I'd, get, I'd be out like I used to be and find out what the people needed and why they needed it so that I could help make the decisions and make the community work. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like that, you know, everybody knew everybody. That's the truth. We knew all their good points and their bad points, you know. And I think that was one of the reasons that we were able to make things work in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because we knew how to approach people and uh, because uh, we knew what they might do in, 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 in any, any uh, reaction concept. It was quite interesting. And as I said, when we, when we finally got to where we had people thinking positively that our community was, good, was not going to the dogs, from that day on we, we sailed right along just from you know. Um, I understand there, there were some memorable court trials. Oh, they, yes, they had several of them, and they, uh, I uh, that involved a lot of the local people, but I wouldn't want to talk about them. I'm well, maybe you, do you remember Colonel Butt, who was a, a lawyer okay. around? Colonel Benoit Butt was one of the sharpest that I ever saw. He was Bill Aker, just Judge Aker's just father-in-law. Colonel Butt and I were great friends, and uh, I remember that we caught some little uh, children eating out of garbage cans, you know, trying to, to, to survive. And he, uh, he, he told me one day, he said, Joe, what are we going to do about them? And then I found somebody who would take them. But, and so Colonel, he, he worked up all the papers and everything else, and I paid the bus fare for them to go up to Titusville to, to go to, to. And we got these children uh, Signed to this this uh, this lady and, and her husband, and those kids turned out to be something really worthwhile within the community and all because that we we worked up those adoption papers. Colonel Butt didn't uh, he didn't want to die; he just wanted to help solve the problem. And that was the way things worked. And he was between he and Bill Akers, who was his son-in-law, who became a circuit judge. You know, they. They knew the law. In fact, they had written a lot of the, the state law legislation because he was in the, uh, he, the colonel was up in Tallahassee a lot of the time. I, he was a great guy, and, and I, had, I admired him no end because when he got on the jury trial, if he was really working, he'd get you crying along with, it, with, it, with everything else. And, and he was just good and a nice gentleman, too. And, and, we were lucky in those days to have those kind of people in our community. A lot of people have mentioned he was a great orator. Oh, I tell you, when he get to talking to the jury and and, uh, and he'd make you think, and he was the best I ever saw. Well, the the state legislature had uh, a lot to do with the kinds of things that happened here. I guess one thing that happened early on was the fact that the cattle used to roam free. Yes, and I, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the, the uh, he became Senate, uh, governor after that, but he was go running around making speeches, and, and he hit a cow and then liked to kill him, and, they, and he came around, to, I saw him, and he was headed on an arm and a sling and a lot of things, 
he pushed to get the cars off of the off the highway and that you had to fin put the fence law in. But you're right, and these great the people don't realize it, but in the early days we had thousands and thousands of cattle and the plats and all those kind of people. That's what they did. And, they, and the hunters and all those people. And they 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 ranged their cattle and the, they they grazed on everybody's property, you know. They uh, and uh, but when they oh this this guy got so bad he beat up and bungled up, you know, and broke bones and everything that he uh, he pushed for the fence law, but the early days they'd graze them. They didn't think about anything grazing cattle 50, 75 miles away from where they were to start. They just let them eat everything, which is good. And, and uh, in a way that wasn't bad, but when people began to, uh, and uh, when they would, uh, each year to make sure the grass was a little better, they would uh, they'd ride along, you know, just throw a match out and get split and had everything. You know, been here back in the days when we used to have some real fires in the in the early days because they'd burn all of the uh, brush off so they had nice green grass come up for the cattle. They didn't think anything about it because it was a uh, it was the way they did things, you know. And they got rid of all of the, the, the trashy growth that was on top and that sort of thing. Yeah, it was uh, uh, this was great cattle country. We all had rodeos in our little town. Well, Galley had a rodeo every year, you know, and uh, uh, every little town had its special day for celebration. Well, Galley's was a Washington's birthday, and uh, Melbourne had Fourth of July, and uh, Coco had some other day, and, and so it was that everybody could go visit the other person. You know. That's what we did. Then, yeah. Would the would the cowboys participate in these special days? <laughs> yeah, they didn't import all the talent in those days. It, but the, the local cowboys did all the riding of the bulls and the horses and the roping and everything else. And you saw, when you went to those, you saw everybody in the, that was in the community because 99% of them all came to see that. It was a, it was a great time, you know, and, and we had quite a, quite a layout out there on Aurora Road that uh, we had a big rodeo field and everything else there. Mm -hmm. And every little town had its own little band, and, they, and for instance, O'Galley and Melbourne used to join together on special days so the band would be bigger, you know, and play, and it, it was an experience. I may be wrong, you, but I'm thinking, didn't some of, weren't there some Seminole Indians that had cattle out well, on the see, west they, side? They, yeah, they, they, in the early days, the, the Seminoles, though, they, met, they were near down around Lake Okeechobee and all that section they were there. That's where they were all they were all in that area, you know. Mm -hmm. But this whole section in here was predominantly uh, uh, controlled by people like the Platts, the three, four families of the Platts and uh, all these others and uh, and uh, but uh, right because of the war we grew up too fast and the cattle business had to become a, a byproduct of what it used to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell us about some uh, memorable legislators that came from this area? Oh, Dr. Creel was a legislator, and, uh, and we were talking about Colonel Butts and Bill Acres and um, Jimmy Pruitt, and uh, Jimmy still lives here, and uh, and of course the present legislators, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to talk about them. <laughs> but Jimmy Pruitt did a great job for us as an example in those early days, and he, uh, he and his entire family and uh, made quite an impression while they were in Tallahassee, and, and the way that the, because of him, the reason we got much of our legislation of the present time through. Well, I guess they were some help, too, as you were trying to expand the county when you were a commissioner. That is correct, yeah. With schools and... And, uh, and, and they would support uh, our growth. As an example, the first appropriation for mosquito control in the early days, O.L. Burton was uh, our legislator, and we asked for some money you know, from the state level, a couple million dollars, and, the, and they appropriated it for the <coughs> our mosquito control, and everybody laughed at us, you know, and they thought, well, that bunch of are just experimenting. But Brevard County took that money, and for two or three years, we were the only people in the, in, the, in the state that wanted to be in the mosquito business. And 
when we find it. Then they suddenly found out that what we were doing was, was solving the problem, then everybody wanted to get into the act. And that's the reason it's under the, it's been state controlled it, it's, ever, ever since, because of, we started it and we did such a good job the first two or three years that, that it expanded all throughout the state. And, and I attribute that all to uh, not only the, the legislators we had in those days, but because of the type of things that we did uh, from the local level to make it a, a, a success. You know, it was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there was such a population boom in the 50s and the 60s. You needed schools left and right. Did the state provide the funds for those schools, or? Well, they, they, they would give part of the money, and then, of course, we had the school tax and everything else that we put in there. And the interesting thing, there were so many young people, you didn't have the problem then that you have today, where you have many retirees and all that sort of thing, but because we had this heavy impact of young people. They realized how important it was to have the school system that was adequate for their children. So they, they vote in favor of, of, of new schools, and when when the old timer and the older people would not support such a thing, that's the reason we got a school system as we have it today. And uh, uh, now they've got to go through a different system. They've got to convince some of these older people that that, that they want to do the right thing. And when they talk about putting in a great fee for building schools and everything else. They're not going to be able to make this thing work unless they convince these people that what they're doing is very important and, and they're going to have to tell them what they're going to do with it and everything else. And, and I think it's very important that we have schools that, that, are, that are properly financed and that sort of thing. And that, But I'm just saying what they need to do is to, to you know, when you talk about $138 million or something, that's a lot of money. And you've got to convince some of these people even the young people, that they're going to spend this in a proper manner. And uh, it, it's going to be a, quite an interesting subject. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, But we've got some beautiful schools. We've, got the, we've had uh, some of the finest facilities and some of the finest per, uh, teacher personnel that, that in the state of Florida. And we're very proud of that, and, and we need to keep that sort of thing. And. And if the school needs to really, what it really needs to do is to do a selling job among the people. They, you can't isolate yourself from, from the general public and make things work. You've got to get with them and, 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 and talk about the things that's going to make, why you want to make this church system work, the school system work. It's quite interesting. We have schools in this county from kindergarten all the way through the community college level. Can you tell us anything about when the community college? Well, it, first of all, it, I can remember when the only kindergarten were private kindergarten, and they came around and 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 talked about them. They talked to my wife who run kindergarten as an example about why all the things uh, that you needed to do and how you incorporated them, and not only her but all the others. First thing you know, they were had incorporated that system into the into the school system, which eliminated many, many uh, little private kindergartens. And uh, this is just quite an interesting approach. And then uh, we got into the community, because so many people could not go far enough to go to college, then we got into the community college program. And we in Brevard County have been exceptionally lucky having Max King, who was born down in Fort Pierce, uh, was, a, was one of the ringleaders who come to our community and develop one of the finest systems in, in, in the state of Florida. And you've got to give him, give him credit. And they look out, his schools look outstanding in any community in the, in the throughout the United States. And when a, you have that kind of a leadership and that kind of a school system, you get something to be proud of. And, and many young people in our community have gone the first two years to this community college because they don't have any facilities to go someplace else. But in that two years of schooling at the, at the community college, they find out exactly where they want to go and what they have to do. And then and then this school system help them get scholarships and that, that sort of thing. It's improved their whole system for schooling within in the state of Florida. And, and we in Brevard County have been looking because we've probably got one of the finest community colleges in the, in, in the United States. 
And that's something to be proud of. There's one of the branches of that campus is uh, right over here as part of this setting we're in. That is correct. And, uh, and in those early days, you'll never know what we went through to get that uh, over there. And the, uh, we went to lawsuits and every other thing to get it there. And it's still there. And, and uh, it, it's one of the nice, it's done a great job within our community. It's something to be real proud of. And it, it only reflects the dignity and the, and the position of throughout the county. Look at the new one down in uh, Palm Bay. Look at the one up in the Central Park. Look at the one in Titusville. They started out from scratch with one, one school up in the Cocoa area. And all of these are, and they're all growing and prospering. They have a tremendous follow. What's going to happen? That which is beginning to happen now is that some of these big colleges are going to be a part of the growth of these units. And many of these children will not have to go to Tallahassee or go someplace else to get a college degree because they, like Rollins College and all of these others, will be a part of the system here within our own community. The young people will uh, can get their college degree uh, without having to, to leave our community. And that's coming. I, it's amazing to me, a lot of people, they don't need a four-year degree. If they can get a specialized two-year degree, they have the kind of credentials they can start working in a lot of different professional-type fields. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. That's an example. Well, my son, oldest son, uh, he, uh, he went to four-year, he went to uh, Florida uh, Southern after he went here for a couple of years. He went to Florida Southern and graduated magna cum laude. Then he came back here and went to Florida Institute, and he got a master's in business administration, and he got a master's in oceanography, and I thought, Lord, I'm going to have nothing but a scholar all the rest of his life. But this, is, this kind of a facility is, is what's helping to make our community grow, and, uh, and it's going to improve, and we're going to have more and more of these big college systems wanting to be a part of this thing, and somehow or another, they're going to end up with four with four year course system within our own, own community. I think that's absolutely right. Um, well, you can tell us some about the early churches that were here when you were young. Well, yes, the uh, we had uh, several, for instance, on the island is Georgiana and all of those, and they, those little churches were the keys to what is it in the system today, you know, the Methodist Church, Georgiana was part of that program. And I remember that uh, when the first churches, the real churches, they were all little wooden churches in the beginning. And I can remember when the, the church down in Melbourne, the Methodist Church down there began to develop and the Catholic Church began to develop from what the, to what they are today. And, and the Episcopal Church uh, used to be over on the US-1 and they moved it all the way out. and. Uh, to where it is today, and I was I was the lucky person who has a contract to build their Episcopal church, and it's a lovely church. And then they built themselves a school beside this, and so has the Catholic church throughout the area. They have their little schools. <coughs> We've come a long way with our school system and our church system, and they, and we're just beginning because they're furnishing the need. And now the, these same churches are building. Uh, homes for the elderly, and, and they're part of their school uh, church system. And that's going to be more and more of that in the future. Quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And people are going to be able to <coughs> be a member of that church. And the Episcopal Church has several units in, in the city of Melbourne right now. But they're, they're going to, all these other churches are going to be able to move into the same category. And furnish, and they'll have a, a, basically a building clientele that they'll have Two-thirds of their church program will be wrapped around these, these older people who are moving into the, into the senior citizen churches. And that's coming. Yeah. The black communities had their own churches, I guess still do for the well, most part. Well, they have a lot of them down there, and, and, uh, and, and a lot of the black children come uh, to, to many of the other school churches on families. In, in, because of the integration in the school system, and they, they now they also in the church system, and uh, many of them have people that sing in the choirs and play musical instruments, and, that, uh, and a lot of this has come out of the college system, and they're very talented people.
and it makes you feel good to see that they're doing such a great job. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like uh, pre-integration, where the black community was pretty much entirely separate from the white community? That, that is true, but I'll tell you, there was a, my, my, many people don't realize the close bond that came between, between the people in those days. You know, I grew up, in, as I said, in the community, and I knew everybody and their brother, and, and, and we urged them to vote, and, and we, we were just thrilled to death when, when something nice happened to them, and uh, I remember some of those that worked for me in the construction business, and they had big families, and, and they, they turned out, and they would send them all to college. Everything else, I was as proud of those kids and, and, and that family as anybody in this community. And, them, and that's what happened. And uh, most people don't realize that they weren't isolated from each other like the people try to con convince you. They, they were part of the community as well. And we all were the same. And uh, we helped each other. And, uh, and, and that's the reason we got along so well. And, and, the, and, these, the, and the, I always got a big thrill out of the fact that <coughs> when a lot of these school teachers and girls have made such a huge success of their lives and then had ch and helped raise all these other children and, and that, that was great growth in our community and uh, we've got some lovely people who've been with us all these years who have been personal friends of all of us and it's a, you read a lot of historical things and you think everybody is angry with everyone else but that isn't true. They are, they, are, they are an integral part of our growth of our community, just as we are. And it's been a great feeling to feel that, that comfortable with all those people. Mm -hmm. well, there's, there's no question that they were disadvantaged, but after integration, what was it like during the, that time of integration? Did it proceed fairly smoothly here? Well, yeah, they, because they had the, the, we have pretty good schools, you know. And the, the churches, and bless their hearts, they did, they did a great job in their churches. And they had athletic programs that just fit. And, and, and we all used to go to their program, all of their contests, and they'd go to our contest. We didn't think anything about it. And that's, uh, no, it, uh, I, I think education, where we begin to let everybody get an education and encourage everybody, both white and black, to do something. It's when we begin to see the bright side of this whole set setup. You just don't uh, force things away and take things away from somebody and give them to someone else unless there's a, a common denominator, you know. And, and, and our, our community has grown up to, to love each other. And, and, then, and I get a big kick out of it in spite of all the people say because I've known many of these people for practically all my life, and it's, it makes me feel good. When I had to get, when the fellows who worked for me had a half a dozen, or a dozen kids, and they all got to college, I was just as proud as Punch as that, that whole family because they, they reflected to me what our community was all about. They, were, they were, ended up in coaches and school teachers and everything else, and then the, and I got such a charge out of it because of from the way they had to start. Yeah. Um, well, we had a lot of people come in to live here, but also a tourist industry grew up around here. That started way back, didn't it? Well, I'll tell you the truth. We had the tourists in here, and the wealthy came in here and, and would come down in the wintertime. If you want to know when things that begin to happen, we had a certain element that it was in here from Ballard's, the Ballard uh, make, flower makers, you know, and the Swift Premium and all those kind of people. But when we started permanent mosquito control, we turned, turned this whole country around. When we began to eliminate the mosquito, people became interested in our community and wanted to come here and stay the year round. And all of the retirees and everything else came because of that mosquito program because we had done something that that no one else had done and that our community reflected new concepts and growth. And, uh, and we've had just, when I think of the thousands, thousands who have come to stay with us because of we've made things more accessible and, and this, this was a great spot in which to live. And, it, and we kept 
the environment the way it needs to be, and the fishing was great, and the hunting was great, and the boating was great. Did you ever see the river out there when you maybe see a hundred little sailboats out there at one time? It makes you think. And that's because of the, that's what's made our community work. But uh, really, the, uh, I think that the attitude of us to, to furnish recreation facilities, furnish the facilities that, that, that people needed, and, uh, and cultural facilities, it, 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 it was just a good place for people to come. You know, you can't expect everybody to come and be on a certain level here, you know. And, and if you're up here, you either get down to theirs or you lift them up to yours. And uh, it, it's quite interesting. You told me a, a little story about uh, Mr. Samella and, and, a, and a mosquito control plane that went a little out of commission. Oh, that was, a, that, that was a, really a, a close shave for Jack Samella. He was a great pilot, you know, and, and he's down where the old ice plant is down in Melbourne. Someone had stuck a, a, an antenna up there, you know, way up in the air, and he come sailing along there one morning, spraying just treetop high, hit that an, uh, antenna, and and he crashed just sort of, just south of that uh, old ice plant, just right on US one down, crashed and. and Tore the, tore the airplane all to pieces with all that mosquito spray in it, and, and it, uh, I, find it, I think it burned it, but he, he got out of the darn thing, and he rushed down to the, find him, he couldn't find him, he, with his head spilled all open there and everything else, he was walking up to the hospital, and they found him on the way up to the hospital, and uh, you can look at him right now, and you can see that he had quite a scar there, but you did him. He was an outstanding leader in the mosquito control for many, many years for us in Brevard County. And one of the reasons we've got such a great uh, influx of people is because of the outstanding job that he had done in, in, in the mosquito control program. He's a great guy, a great person. He's still around and a very good friend. Another thing he was interested in, and, and something that relates to the Cape, is uh, he was very interested in the wildlife. And they put that wildlife refuge up there at the Cape. Have you had any involvement with that? Oh yes, yes. And then the, uh, see, the county dug all of the dikes up there and everything else to impound the water and everything else and so that they had, and they impounded and put uh, fish in them so that they would feed up the larva, larva and everything else. And by doing that, and with the cooperation of the Air Force, you know, they wanted, uh, they insisted that the county run the mosquito control program up there because of the things we've been doing in the past. And this whole area uh, was controlled under mosquito control by the county program under Jack Salamella. And uh, I've been up there many times, and uh, but I remember one morning I was flying up there looking at the, over to see what the dikes were, how they were holding up and all. And uh, I said to the pilot, and uh, he was an outstanding old timer from up on Merritt Island. And I said, uh, I wonder what it, I said, what is that down there? And he, he said, look, look, and he swung down, and the biggest old panther I ever saw was walking along there. And he, all he did was look up in the air and, and look back down, totally ignored us, and kept walking along. That's how. The, the, the animal uh, population up there adjusted itself to the missile program and to the airplanes and everything else. He just looked up and saw we weren't going to do anything to hurt him, and he just kept walking, you know. And in those days, and, and those fish beds up there, they would just boil with, with fish. You know. And uh, and I attribute 99% of that of the, to the way that the mosquito control uh, had taken care of the problem up there. And, and you're right, it's a great pre uh, preserving, preserving area for all types of wildlife, and still is. The, and, and it will be, and one day it'll be as well known for its uh, the preserving of, of the, of the live, live uh, wild animal as it is for the missile base. And that's coming, because they, they've left all the necessary vegetation and everything else and they've kept people from coming in there and, and 
and shooting all the game and everything else. And so they're, they're getting adjusted to people, they're getting adjusted to noise, and they will be adjusting to all the growth for the future. Quite interesting. It's an amazing area. Yeah. It's, it's so much bigger than you realize. Cause well, they, they don't realize the thousands of acres that are in that thing. And as I said, it, uh, and it's going to be accessible to the public a great deal more because they've got the proper road system in there now and all, and uh, they're going to make sure that the, the, that guy who wants to come in and poach and, and wipe out the game, he won't have a chance in that area because they're going to make sure that that the animal life is protected along with all of the, the program uh, of the missile system. That security system for the that's missiles has right. paid off. That's, that's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, tell me about any hurricanes that you remember. Well, they, we've had a lot of hurricanes since I've been a boy here in the area, but I think many, many years ago, one of the most interesting things that I can remember was, uh, was the uh, the mayor of the city of Ogallee back in those early days, Joe Torrance. We had, there was a terrible hurricane and, it, and uh, there was a packing house just south of the, uh, well, it was the old Oleander's Hotel, which is right on the end of the causeway down there. Now it's a, it's a restaurant now. But anyhow, the big, big pieces of metal were coming off this packing house and sailing up the street all the way up across the Highland Avenue in that section. 